So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gil McGowan. I'm president of the Alberta Federation of Labor. And on behalf of the AFL and all of our affiliated unions, I would like to welcome all of you to the latest installment uh, in our ongoing virtual Lunch and Learn series. So far this summer, we've talked about labor rights, we've talked about health and safety, uh, and, and also the unfolding energy transition. Uh, today's session uh, is going to focus on public services. Uh, we're going to talk about how important public services are uh, to our economy, to our society, and why we need to make sure that these, uh, these services are well supported and well funded. Um, but that's an open question right now. Uh, if you look across uh, our province, our country, and indeed uh, the entire North American continent, we have politicians um, and media pundits in places like uh, Florida and Texas who are literally demonizing public sector workers, uh, especially teachers, uh, going so far as accusing them of uh, grooming students for some nefarious purposes. Here in Canada, just yesterday, we had uh, a meeting of conservative premiers in the Atlantic provinces uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, from their perspective, the need to privatize our health care services. And, and here in Alberta, uh, the, the leading candidate for uh, the uh, UCP leadership who likely will become premier um, sometime after the leadership um, in, in October, has talked about Uberizing public services. So that's, that's the landscape um, across this country. We're witnessing uh, an ongoing attack. And, I th and that, that word is not too strong. Um, an ongoing attack on our public services. Uh, conservative provincial governments have been chronically underfunding health care, uh, K-12 education, post-secondary education, and many, many other vital public services. Uh, and they're using the resulting chaos to justify uh, moves towards privatization. So today we're going to examine uh, the current state of our public services and the politics as, uh, that are putting them at risk. Uh, and uh, on a more hopeful note, <laughs> we're also going to be talking about uh, how concerned Albertans and concerned Canadians uh, can push back and build a better brighter future for our country uh, on the foundations of uh, um, high quality public services that are uh, publicly funded and publicly delivered. So uh, to lead us through this discussion, uh, we're very lucky to be joined uh, by two very special guests, Alex Himmelfarb and Brad LaFortune. Uh, Alex uh, is an author, advocate, uh, and the former clerk of the Privy Council of Canada. Uh, which means that he was in charge of the federal public service for years. Uh, Alex has had a front row seat uh, to the politics that have led us uh, to this current situation. And he has written passionately uh, about why we need to reverse course uh, and once again start uh, defending and supporting the public services that provide such an important foundation for, for our country. So welcome, Alex. And uh, we're also joined today by Brad LaFortune, who is the Executive Director of Public Interest Alberta. Uh, he's uh, a longtime activist in this province and a friend to many. Um, and uh, PIA, as most of you will know, is one of our province's leading advocacy groups. Uh, before joining PIA as, uh, as uh, its as Executive Director, uh, Brad also served as a Chief of Staff for Labour Minister Christina Gray in the Notley government. Uh, he's a passionate advocate on a wide range of issues, uh, including seniors care, health care, and affordable housing. Um, and so welcome, Brad. Um, so for our format today, we're, we're going to give each of our speakers 10 minutes uh, to talk about, 10 to 15 minutes to talk about uh, the importance of public services from their perspective. We're going to hear first from Alex, who's going to provide a Canadian perspective. Then we'll move on uh, to Brad for an Alberta perspective. Uh, once they've spoken, uh, we'll open uh, up for some discussion between the two. Uh, and then we'll give uh, everyone in the audience an opportunity to put forward their questions. Uh, you can find a, a question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. So when it comes to that time, uh, you can uh, identify your interest in asking a question, and uh, then we will uh, make your microphone and your camera live, and you can ask that directly. Alternately, you can put your questions in the chat. 
And uh, just a reminder for everyone that this session is being recorded, uh, just to keep that in mind when you're asking your questions. Uh, and then also it'll be available uh, on the AFL's YouTube channel uh, once, uh, once we're done. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn things over to our speakers, uh, starting with Alex. So thanks very much for being with us, Alex. Uh, the floor is yours to talk about uh, public services from a Canadian perspective. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Gil, and uh, thanks, uh, MC and Gil, for the invitation. I'm glad to join you, Brad, on, on the panel. I'm going to, to kind of talk backwards about the issue. I'm not going to talk directly about public services, but about the politics of austerity and four decades of, of the consequences of austerity and what happens when you squeeze public services, don't value government, treat government as overhead, treat public servants as expendable and don't make the investments necessary. Um, apparently I have 10 minutes and I have about 42, 43 hours worth of material. So so bear with me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to go right into the conclusions I would give from my four hour speech. And Alex, can I just interrupt for a second? Your, your microphone yeah. sounds pretty bad. Um, is there any way you can improve the sound? I just want to make sure that people have, uh, you know, an Is this any better if I come that's, up closer? Yeah, that's much better. Yeah. yeah. I think better. it's just a question okay. of proximity to the microphone. <laughs> yeah. Okay, dynamite. Thanks, Alex. So, you bet. Let me, let me start by defining for the purposes of this talk what I mean by austerity. And I, austerity for me is an ideology. It's a way of looking. It's, and it is, it is the belief that whatever the problem, the solution is always the same, cut taxes, cut services, suppress wages. Whatever the problem, climate change, cut taxes, cut wages, cut services. Inequality, same. Austerity has dominated political thinking and the public discourse for over four decades. And let me take you quickly through my five major consequences of this austerity agenda. Number one, austerity is toxic. Uh, just a couple of years back, about 500 health professionals, psychiatrists and psychologists, mental health professionals got together and penned an open letter, which they published in The Guardian, in which they said they, have, they were confronting a new series of disorders that they attributed to to austerity, what they found is more and more of their patients were coming to them with high levels of economic anxiety, high levels of economic insecurity, worried that they were on their own to face the big changes that were coming, worried about the future for their kids, worried about survival. And more profoundly, they blamed themselves for these problems rather than the collective or even even more profoundly, they looked for scapegoats to blame. And they warned that, that we were heading to real potential personal and collective disruption if we didn't end our, our love affair with austerity. We don't, in Canada, don't have to look too far to see the similar toxic consequences of austerity. Just think of the pandemic. For me, the pandemic had two contradictory lessons. The first lesson was how important public servants and public services are as they rose to the occasion, helped us frontline workers, frontline public servants, teachers, health professionals, did put themselves at risk to get us through, uh, to protect us from the virus, to deliver uh, vaccines, to deliver advice, and to deliver programs that kept us afloat. So we learned, I think, without question, the extraordinary vitality of our public servants, the courage of our public servants, and the importance of public servants and public services. At the same time, I think, we had this powerful reminder of the huge costs of decades of cutting public services and exploiting public servants. So we saw, for example, how ill-prepared we were for a pandemic that experts had long warned was coming. 
we saw how badly our stretched healthcare system performed. We saw how weak our social programs were, how weak our labor protections were with no sick days or insufficient sick days to, to allow people to do what's safe, not only for themselves, but for their fellow workers and the customers. We saw the consequences of austerity close up. And most profoundly, we saw how austerity yielded deep and, 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 and extreme inequality also played out in the pandemic as the pandemic fed off those inequalities, hurting most those most vulnerable, hurting most those most in need. So the pandemic lesson, a vital creative public service is huge for meeting our challenges. And austerity has ill-equipped us, which takes me to the, the second conclusion, and that is austerity has seriously eroded our collective toolkit, the toolkit we use to solve our collective challenges. My favorite sociologist, a fellow by the name of, name of uh, Sigmund Bauman, was towards the end of his life, totally preoccupied by what he called the erosion of the collective, the erosion of our common sense of, of purpose, of any sense of the common good, how we had replaced uh, the public good with private interest, how we we replaced the common goals with, commer with commerce, how we had substituted over and over again private where public was necessary. And he, near his death, he, he wrote that rarely has a generation been faced with the kind of collective action problems that we have, climate change, eroding um, environment, the degradation of the environment, social fragmentation, inequality. Rarely have we confronted the kind of existential challenges before us, yet our tool, collective toolkit for challenging those problems has never been weaker. Now, austerity forces a kind of short-termism as we put off key investments. We put off investments in the environment and climate change in prevention in pandemic prevention and preparedness, pushing those off of future generations, pretending that we're protecting those generations, pushing them off to future governments, pretending that somehow fiscal health is more important than health to the planet or human health. How in the hell did we get to a place where fiscal health takes precedent over human health and planetary health? In any case, the, the uh, the erosion of our collective toolkit has been profound. Just, just to take, I don't know how, how I'm doing on time, but just quickly to take this notion that somehow small government is the answer to every question. Small government's an ideology. There's, I have never known a progressive who says, you know, we need big government, make government as big as possible, let's raise taxes as high as we can get them. What progressives believe is we have to shape our future together and government has to be big enough and strong enough to achieve our collective purpose and taxes have to be high enough to pay for that. It's the ideologues are the ones who say, no, no matter what we need, no matter what challenges we face, we have to make government small and they make government weak. And they don't want government to be weak. They want government to be strong enough to protect the market and those who benefit most from it, but not to protect the collective. And so we have to, to understand that we need to rebuild that collective toolkit. Takes me to conclusion number three. There's only five, we're almost there. Conclusion number three is that austerity has stunted the political imagination. We don't know how much to expect anymore and we expect less than we used to. Almost every poll, ECOS or Ipsos, or almost every poll you look at this track what kind of world we want shows that we want the same things we wanted in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We want a good job, good education, good health care, safe and healthy communities, a livable environment, help for the people who need it, decent working conditions. We want the same things we've always wanted, a safe and secure retirement. What has changed from the 50s and 60s is we no longer believe we can afford it. We no longer believe the government's up to it. We have squeezed 
this the political imagination and we have to instead of lowering expectations which is what government has done we have to raise aspirations we can have the nice things that we've been told over and again over and over again um, that we can't afford but because we've started the political imagination too many of us vote for governments that are going to privatize the public that and, 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 and part of the problem is that the austerity you know i have this image of somebody in a traffic jam in, in toronto who says you know i hate government i have invested in transportation i hate government we, I don't want to pay taxes anymore. When in fact, taxes is what would have been needed to fix that problem. The one, who, the, the, the couple who, who who can't find childcare and say, you know, I can't find affordable childcare, and therefore I hate government. When in fact, it's taxes and government that's going to fix childcare. So, what 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 the, what the conservative governments have done is they've starved the beast. They've made public services seem inadequate. And then they privatize in, in a two-step process. And we have to say, no, no more privatization, no more squeezing the beast. We can have the kind of, of world we want, and we are ready to pay for it. That, that brings me to the fourth and, and penultimate conclusion, which is austerity is built on a web of lies. The first lie is that tax cuts are free. Tax cuts are never free. They never pay for themselves. They never have, they never will, not on Earth, not on the universe, not on any planet, not in any country. Tax cuts have cost to public services. Inevitably, they cost most to the people who depend on services most. Tax cuts benefit those who need the benefits least. Somehow or other, the right, the right has, has managed to convince us that taxes are a burden or even a punishment when, in fact, they are the price we pay for the country we want. And, and we will get the country to the extent that we're willing to pay the freight. The second lie is debt and debt management. So we have to balance every budget and all debt is bad. You know, so there's a debate to be had about good debt versus bad debt. But this notion that governments have to balance budgets like households is nonsense. Households cannot print money. I mean, I wish we could, but we cannot. Governments can print money, and they're not a country like Canada, which has its sovereign currency, is not going to face bankruptcy. Debt is not, is not the, the horror that is made out to be. But the biggest lie, the biggest lie is the inflation lie, which we're playing with now. The, the notion of, you know, the danger is some kind of wage price spiral. We have to manage expectations and raise interest rates to avoid it. There's no risk of a wage spice, a price spiral. Wages have lagged for decades. Right now, the small increases we see in some sectors overdue and needed lag behind inflation. What we have is a profit price spiral. And what we have to do is get at profit, tax it, enforce competition laws, get our focus right, and stop buying into the lies. You know, this whole trickle down economy, this notion that wealth trickles down, something's trickling down, but it ain't wealth. The final conclusion, uh, Conclusion number five is, yes, there is an alternative. There is always an alternative. When any politician tells you there's no alternative, you have to understand immediately that, of course, there's an alternative. That's probably one you'd prefer if it was on offer. There are alternatives. It's time for bold alternatives. This is not just about incremental change working within this existing paradigm. This is about changing our common sense, putting the planet and people first reversing austerity, reversing privatization, and taking collective hold of the future. There you have it. Ten minutes. Did I do it? You did. And uh, that was incredible, actually. It was the tour de force of important issues in a, in a, in a very uh, concise uh, time frame. So thank you very much, much Alex. Uh, so we'll turn over to Brad to talk about uh, uh, public services from an Alberta perspective, and I imagine that uh, uh, Brad uh, found a lot that resonates um, in Alberta with what Alex just said. So, over to you, Brad. Thanks, thank you, Gail, and thanks, Alex. It's it's uh, it's an honor to be sharing this uh, Zoom space with you, and I love your one-liners uh, a lot. I feel like I've learned a lot from you over the years. Um, I just kind of want to bring you into my office here, and I think this is an experience that we're all having right now. Is that no matter how hard we try. We can't escape this guy. Another big whopper, I resign. 
Um, but the problem in Alberta is much bigger than that. But before I get started, I just want to thank uh, MC and Gil and, and Beth and everyone at AFL for uh, creating this space and inviting inviting us at PA to be part of it. Um, my name is Bradley. I'm joining from uh, Treaty 6 territory here in Amaskwachi, Wiskaigan, which is uh, in uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Um, personally, I'm an uninvited settler um, and I work as the executive director of Public Interest Alberta now. Um, and our mission is really simply to do the kinds of things that Alex and Gil and others are talking about when it comes to public services. So our mission is to preserve, strengthen, and promote public services and public institutions in Alberta. Um, we have a big, bold vision for uh, working with the labor movement and civil society to do that. Um, and it's funny because over the years, I've worked in a lot of different places in and around government. I've worked for the Alberta Federation of Labor. Uh, I worked, as Gil mentioned, for the Labor Minister, uh, Christina Gray, under the New Democrat government from 2015 to 2019. Um, I've done some organizing here and there as well, mostly in Alberta, but I grew up in Saskatoon. Um, and over and over and over again, what we hear, um, not only from outside voices like Restaurants Canada or, or lobbying voices, but even from institutional voices as well that are embedded in our institutions. And more and more we hear this is that now is not the time. We have to wait. Market conditions need to improve. There's reasons why we can't move as fast as we want to. And um, you know, hearing that over and over again is why I have this big bulging vein on my forehead. It's, it's very frustrating, especially when we see this sort of overlapping crises that we're all experiencing, I think, in more kind of direct and embodied ways in our communities and personally. So uh, I'm really happy to be here to talk about public services today. Now, when I think about the public sector, it's really founded on the basic belief that people want good things for each other, regardless of who they are to one another. And it's about advancing the public good so that we and our neighbors can have safe and healthy environments to live in, and so that we can all contribute uh, according to our abilities and our will uh, to that society. Um, so really, it's just the basic belief that we have inherent value to one another and to our communities and that we should be able to contribute to that. And it's precisely the opposite of what some of us have heard uh, leaders going back over the past four decades in particular, as Alex was saying, um, you know, including Margaret, Margaret Thatcher. And I want to read a quote here just to make our collective blood boil uh, as we talk about the Alberta situation. This is what Margaret Thatcher said about society. People are casting their problems on society and who is society? There's no such thing. There are individual men and women and there are families and no government can do anything except through people and people look to themselves first. So Margaret Thatcher is no longer with us, um, but, uh, but her ideology it still is. Um, and, you know, the sort of plague that uh, or the toxicity that Alex was talking about from Reagan Reaganomics to Margaret Thatcher and so many others that really came up, you know, in the 70s and 80s and kind of continues to haunt us today is hitting us really hard here close to home. Um, and the problem's more challenging now because the material conditions as they worsen, what you see is the fragmentation of civil society and our public institutions and the real toll that that takes on individuals and organizations like our labor movement, um, like civil society and others who are really on the front lines of trying to advocate for an alternative. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a real big problem. It's a challenge for our movements and living through, you know, COVID for the past few years, a couple of years now has, has only compounded that problem. People feel further apart um, and the forces of conservatism uh, really kind of seem like common sense um, to a lot of people. And I would say that what we've seen now, whereas, you know, in the past, Margaret Thatcher would say society doesn't exist. Now we have conservative leaders like Jason Kenney um, and, you know, his merry band of UCP idiots uh, saying, you know, they, they don't say that out loud anymore, or at least not as directly. What they say is, you know, um, there's choice to be had in education. Instead of saying, you know, healthcare is not a human right, um, they say we need more innovation and we need to make it more sustainable. And so the coded language and the way that they talk about things has evolved over time as a result of decades of investment from everyone from the Koch brothers to the conservative parties uh, across Canada and North America. And they've really refined their approach to 
um, instilling that ideology uh, in our discourse and in our minds. Um, and then all the while, you know, the gilded classes, um, multinational corporations are making out like bandits on the backs of seniors care, kids education, basic necessity like housing, water, uh, utilities and essential services. Um, so with all of that in mind, um, I, I, I really believe that we need nothing short of a, a very fundamental and profound shift in our consciousness um, combined with the building of powerful movements through the labor movement, through civil society, um, so that we can dislodge those current paradigms um, in really fundamental ways. And one thing that I that I like about what Alex was saying and what I've heard, you know, Gil talk about and the Federation of Labor work on as well, is that it's it's really not the time for us to talk about tinkering any longer. We need massive shifts in the way that we think about how we pay for and provide basic services for people and how we can sustain and strengthen our economy so that it works for people. You know, we've seen some good campaigns, I think, over the past uh, the past several years in the UK and the United States, whether it's, you know, political leaders or third parties like the big unions over in the UK. The most recent one that I think is really cool is Enough is Enough. And it's really imbued with that strong sense of righteous indignation, the fact that we need real urgent solutions for the problems facing us. So I want to bring it down to Alberta just very briefly here and talk about what we're seeing, what we have seen over the past couple of years. So here in Alberta, when it comes to the public services, they've been starved for decades, like everywhere else. Um, and, you know, the one term government that I had the, the privilege of, of working for uh, in the labor ministry um, I'll be the first to admit it, it didn't result in the kind of radical course correction that uh, maybe a lot of us were, were really hoping for. Um, and this sort of, you know, changes to how we think about how we budget, you know, is it about, is it about, uh, you know, basic metrics like, you know, neoliberal things like the GDP, jobs numbers, investment, or is it about well-being and health and sustainability? Um, and different measures that, you know, places like New Zealand and Wales are looking at. We didn't really see the kind of change in the blueprints um, to our budgeting and how we fund public services that I, I, I've come to think that we really need to start thinking about urgently and implementing now. Um, so, you know, instead of things like, you know, in Alberta, we could talk about zero-based budgeting or results-based budgeting under Redford or bending the cost curve in healthcare to make it sustainable or sustainable funding for health and education um, or reimagining city services. Like, you know, some of you who are working at the municipal level know that uh, our council and administration are talking about. These are just different ways of saying that we need to do austerity, but we need to do it maybe a little bit more lightly and a little bit more intelligently. Um, and I think that, you know, I want to be very clear. It's my understanding based on, you know, working in and around our movements for the past several years and hearing from people like Alex and, and other leaders in, in, in our movements that we need a really fundamental and urgent shift away from that mentality. Um, it's just not working for us to continue to slide towards what our imagined uh, uh, realm of the possible is as progressives or radicals or lefties, whatever you want to call yourself, I don't really care. But I think we need a profound shift away from that idea that we need to be pragmatic. I think that we need to be bold and I think we need to be radical. Um, and basically that just means not taking a market lens to our public services, but saying that they're inherently good because they provide a quality of life for people and our communities and our families that we, we demand. And, and we, we think that we deserve collectively because we do live in a society. Um, so, you know, we have centrist governments all over the place and leaders talking about making public services more sustainable, more resilient, more innovative. And meanwhile, the cuts in privatization keep on happening, right? We have the hiving off of our lab services. We have more and more privatization in seniors care. Um, we have, uh, you know, even with the investment in, in, in public childcare from the federal government, massive, you know, game changing investments in terms of affordability, slashing costs in half for families. But, you know, in Alberta, they have a special provision and basically an arrangement with the federal government and implementation committee to say, well, we're not going to force you to, you know, demarketize what you currently have because 70% of providers are, are, are private. And so even when we have those massive injections, um, we're not talking about building 
you know, social democratic or, or public sort of services. We're talking about doing things that will not upset the apple cart too much. So, you know, I, I guess that's my main point and takeaway is that we need a radical shift away from that. When we look at the Kenny government or the UCP government, and maybe it's going to be Danielle Smith's government on October 6th, um, it's going to be more of the same. Um, and I think one of the things that is really important for, for PIA and, and for uh, all of us to think about is that when you hear your friends and colleagues say like, well, maybe, maybe, um, well, I don't know who, like whatever UCP leadership candidate um, is out there who might win um, is not going to be as bad as Jason Kenney. Um, I think we should, you know, say, <laughs> yes, they will be. They might be worse, but it doesn't matter. We need a change in government first and foremost. Um, and then right now, and not, not after the election, we need to start having conversations with all of the leaders and all of the people involved in political parties uh, about the, the shift that we need to, to strengthen public services, not after the election, but now. And so that's the single theme that I think about every time that we launch a campaign is that we need big, bold solutions, not tinkering, um, to begin to uh, lessen that divide between the haves and the have-nots. And I think there's a real appetite for a conversation that is a different type of populism as well. We've seen a few politicians come close to being successful across North America and beyond. Um, I love hearing from people who are working in Europe on, you know, social democratic movements and new political parties who are, you know, multinational talking about connecting with people's sense of unfairness in the system in ways that are inspiring and just honest. Um, because I think that's what people in Alberta are looking for right now. And so what we've been focusing on is trying to have conversations with our partners at the AFL and in Friends of Medicare and in Parkland in inspiring people to um, believe again that, um, you know, like the imagination that you're talking about, Alex, um, is possible and can be enlivened with not even new ideas, but old ideas that, you know, made a little bit more of a difference in the past. Housing solutions, for example, until 1992-93. Let's invest in public housing. And that people, um, that everyone has a role to play. Um, I always like to say that advocacy is for everyone. Like if I can do it, I'm an extremely awkward person, um, but I like getting out there to city council and you know, you can take your five minutes and do it and they listen to you. And sometimes it results in changes to decisions like not building a silly gondola across the North Saskatchewan River, but advocacy is for everyone and everyone can do it. And I think the more, the more that we begin to believe that again, the more that we can influence our institutions and our parties to, uh, to reinvest in public services in the way that we need, because, you know, um, I don't want to wait for the next time that I can't drive out to BC to see my family when the roads flood away. You know, I don't want to wait for the next heat dome. This is going to be, the coolest summer that probably I'll ever experience. Um, it's only going to get hotter. And I think we need big, bold climate um, and public solutions to, uh, to these overlapping crises and problems that we have. And so it's a, it's a major moment of opportunity, um, but it's, it's also just feels like the most daunting set of challenges that we've ever faced collectively in our movements. Um, and so, you know, as a starting point, we need to talk about what we, what we really value and just taking it back to the beginning is that, you know, we believe in, um, we believe in society and we believe that what we have for ourselves, others should have for themselves as well. And that, uh, you know, Maggie Thatcher and others who have come and gone can, uh, can hopefully stay in the past and not come back to haunt us anymore. So uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Um, and thank you for, for having us here today, Gil. It's been fun. Well, thanks very much, Brad. Uh, and, and thanks, Alex. Uh, you know, I, I've been an activist in this province uh, since the 90s. I cut my teeth uh, as, uh, as a union shop steward during uh, what they called the Klein Revolution, which, um, you know, uh, <laughs> involved massive cuts to our public services. And one of the things that strikes me about what I'm hearing today is that many of the arguments are the same. Um, but the flip side of, is, of that is that uh, while the arguments are the same, the situation is not. And so I just want to ask a couple of questions about 
the arguments that we hear over and over again and maybe get uh, Alex and Brad to talk about them. But then I want to return to this question about how the situation is, 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 has changed dramatically since the 90s. And to Alex's point, the, the need for collective action, action through public services is even more uh, urgent than ever. So, but, but in terms of the, the stuff that I hear over and over again, I'm, I'm just going to see if I can get Alex uh, and, and Brad to respond um, to these arguments because we're hearing them again, especially in, in the lead up to what I think is going to be a pretty pivotal provincial election here in Alberta. So the first thing I hear uh, is that uh, conservatives actually care for public services. They, uh, they, they never acknowledge that, that, their, uh, that their project is, is to undermine public services. Um, but what they say is, uh, you know, the services will be there under a conservative government. It just doesn't matter who delivers them. And in fact, I heard that just yesterday from the conservative premiers from Atlantic Canada say like, you know, of course we support our healthcare system. Um, and so my question uh, for Alex and Brad is, does it matter who delivers these services, either public or private? Shall I jump in? Yeah. Well, I, first of all, let, let me let me take a different angle to your question because part of the problem is that progressives have been a huge conservative influence on public services because they, against the cutting of right wing governments. They have tried, they've fought hard to preserve the status quo. And that's a killer. That's a killer. Neither of them, neither the right nor the left, should be preserving programs we have. We should be transforming them for a future. We should be making them better. Preserving Medicare without pharmacare and dental care and kind of, of, of investments in that. Preserving what we have is a recipe for losing what we have. We have got to make it better. We've got to make it Medicare for the 21st century. We've got to make it child care for the 21st century. We emulate Sweden where the take-up rate for child care is over 90% rather than other places where it's 20%. We have to make these things better. And, and because the, the, the left has become defensive in the face of cuts and austerity, we have spent almost all our time defending what is instead of building what could be. I would trust no government who says the services will still be there. I want a government who says they're going to be better. Well said. Uh, Brad, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, I remember when uh, when Jason Kenney was running for leader and he, um, he loves those gimmicks, right? Um, and so he stood up on a stage and signed the public health guarantee. Um, and I think a lot of people wanted to believe him and, and chose to, um, that, you know, he wasn't going to touch healthcare, but I think, um, I think it's really important to, to point out, um, that, you know, you can't trust, um, you can't trust political leaders who have proven over and over again that, um, they are going to break their promises when it comes to the preservation of our current services. And then I also think that it's important for us to think about what people are really experiencing and conversations that they're having about their lack of access to, you know, maybe a, a family doctor or a specialist or, you know, thinking about surgery, wait times. Um, and that makes me think about back to, you know, watching, you know, thinking about, you know, the birth of Medicare and Saskatchewan and, what kinds of popular demands there were that were being met by that government um, that managed to overcome really powerful reactionary forces who were saying we can't possibly work under a state-run system as and that popular demand for it. And so I think it's interesting now in this moment because we have existing public services that are under a lot of strain. Um, and sometimes we think, you know, oh, we need to sustain funding according to, you know, population growth and, you know, cost of living increases, you know, uh, or inflation when it comes to education. And I'm not sure that's really, that that's really the winning sort of message or formula. And I think that gets to what you were saying a little bit, Alex, too, is we really need to focus on the transformation of public services and that it should be inspired by and very informed by the real kind of needs that people and families and communities are, are experiencing. 
Thanks, Brad. Um, you know, further on uh, the vein of old arguments that I've heard, <laughs> um, you know, in the same way that I've heard uh, conservatives in this province, the new breed of conservatives repeat um, the argument that it doesn't matter who delivers the service as long as you have the service. I've also heard over and over, over the last year and a half and, and continuing th through this leadership race with the conservatives, uh, you know, they, they argue that public services are A, not sustainable. Uh, they argue that uh, B, wages for public sector work workers are the problem. Uh, and then C, they say that the private sector uh, will provide innovation and choice. So th those are the three things that I would like to challenge you guys to address. These are the arguments that are being put forward. So, um, you know, so uh, public services, are they sustainable? Uh, B, public services, do we pay our public sector workers too much? And C, are we missing out on innovation and choice if we don't privatize services? Uh, th that's, that's their menu. How do you respond to that, Alex? Well, let me let me start with the wages. The Fraser Institute every year does a a, a, a piece on on the public servants that are getting hundred thousand dollars or more and how how atrocious it is that we're paying people this kind of money. And every year they do this nonsense, and every year the media covers it. And a blogger and journalists from Ottawa once put to them the question, how many of your economists are paid more than $100,000? And the answer was, of course, almost all of them. But then they said, well, but we have to do that if we're going to get quality, if we're going to sustain the quality of our, of our research, so such that it is. Well, the, we're talking about people who teach our kids, who take care of our health, make sure we get our, our checks, who, who keep us safe, who keep our communities clean. I want quality and I want to pay these people. I want to pay these people what, what they're worth and I want to stop treating them as overhead. And of course we can pay them what they're worth. And frankly, when we pay public sector workers what they're worth, all workers go up because they become a lead and 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 yeah, we can afford the public ser ser services we want because, in fact, it's the last great bargain. Public health is the last great bargain. When you know, first of all, look at, at the privatization of long-term care and how many elderly people died needlessly. How much suffering went in because the private sector is not accountable dem democratically. It skims the best cases. It cuts costs to, to increase profit because its responsibility is not to the citizenship and the society. Its responsibility is to the shareholder. Well, I want citizens to be the shareholders. And that's what public services do. We cannot afford to weaken public services. We cannot afford any more privatization. We can't afford the boondoggles. And think about the costs of privatization, the enormous costs of, of water failures. A lie. An even playing field and democratic accountability. Okay, the pub, our public servants have point that I that I raised the the except for the and uh, I, I mean we hear this over and over again especially from it they say for innovation and why wouldn't we people who talk about innovation, how they're leading innovation exists because of government mission driven expenditures that government has been historically and demonstrably the driver of innovation. We wouldn't have all of this high tech digital uh, uh, 
development if it weren't for government, government investment. Now's the time for government to drive innovation by investing in mission-driven work on climate change, on a real Green New Deal. You watch how much innovation comes out of that. You watch how innovative uh, the private sector becomes when it feeds off government innovation. The innovative cycle has almost invariably started with public investment because we have the capacity and because it's mission driven. And so it brings together diverse innovators to common purpose. You want innovation, do a Green New Deal. Thanks very much, Alex. And just for our listeners who may not have uh, be familiar with the reference, uh, Alex was talking about a, a recent book uh, written by the famous economist Mariana Mazzucato called Mission Economy. And she talks about how a lot of the big things that uh, we've accomplished across the world, including things like the Apollo moonshot, uh, development of vaccines, uh, the, the, you know, the, the components that, uh, you know, allowed for the tech revolution, they weren't developed by private, uh, uh, actors that were developed by governments uh, who, uh, and it was the private companies that commercialized them and turned them into profit engines, but it was government uh, and, you know, public sector spending that led the way in terms of identifying the missions um, that uh, the, the private sector is sort of uh, piggybacking. I, yeah, Alex, yeah. Can I just add a, a concrete example? Just Canada used to be a leader in vaccine production and distribution because we had a public agency responsible for doing it. We were the leaders in innovation, manufacturing, distribution, scientific research. And we, and we privatized it. And now we're dependent. And we're dependent on private sector manufacturers, global manufacturers with problematic and fragile supply chains uh, who are profit driven. And w we can't even provide in, in, in a global a citizen way to third uh, world countries because of patent uh, costs. Whereas the public, we would be able to be a world leader in, in vaccine distribution, not just for our own, but for others. So, you know, every time we have privatized one of these public institutions, we have actually cost us economically as well as socially and morally. Yeah. Yeah, from a labor point of view, if uh, we had uh, held on to a, vac a publicly owned vaccine manufacturing, we also would have created jobs and employment for for people here in Alberta. We're, with this, uh, you know, we're a labor group, so we always think about that. You know, um, often when you privatize public services or crown corporations, uh, not only are you um, exposing yourself to the vagaries of the market, and but in many cases, you're actually losing the opportunity to create wealth um, and and create jobs here in Canada as well. Uh, Brad, did you want to jump in there as well? Yeah, thanks, Gil. I mean, you know, when I think about housing as an example, uh, you know, a public service that's completely underfunded, uh, and you know, you you talk about innovation, sustainability, and creative solutions to you know sustain these services, and that means privatization to conservatives. It's like, well, you know, like. Where, where's the truth in that? I mean, you know, we have uh, we have the highest food insecurity in, in the country, according to a report from U of T that just came out. We've got 24,000 people on wait lists for supportive housing. Homelessness has doubled in the city of Edmonton since the beginning of the pandemic. And then you have the housing minister here in, in Alberta saying, well, you know what we need to do to solve the problem is to privatize all of our remaining and, you know, decrepit stock from the Alberta Social Housing Corporation. You know, it, it's just it, it's so it's like the experience doesn't match up with the language anymore. And I think we need to call it out. Um, and and I guess also just generally speaking, you know, like, Gil, you know, you and I have talked about this for years. And Alex, you know, I've, I've read lots of your stuff as well. I think we're all on the same page. But there's some things that are just uh, uh, too important uh, to leave to the vagaries of of the market and, uh, you know, public health housing, education, these are, these are public goods. And those are things that we can just, you know, I think start to say more boldly uh, and consistently that, you know, yeah, they, they have a cost, but they're worth it. And they shouldn't be subject to the same sort of logic of, you know, the market um, because it's a public good. I mean, I'm just getting so frustrated with trying to 
compete or, you know, win arguments about like how we can be smarter in the public sector when it comes to delivering this service or this thing when, you know, uh, it just turns out that, you know, housing is a human right, according to the UN, and now the government of Canada and more institutions and organizations are letting that kind of deep in the root. So if it's a human right, well, if you look around, are we living up to that? No, we're not. And so we can't wait for the market to solve it because it never will. Um, so I think, um, I think, uh, I think it's important for us to just sort of just reject the premise of the question, as our outgoing premier would say. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Uh, listen, we have a few questions in the chat, which so I'm just going to read them out uh, for Alex and Brad. The first two uh, are on a similar topic, so I'll read them together. Uh, the first question <clears throat> comes from Chris, and he says, uh, could you comment on the degree of public support for raising taxes for better public services, maybe more accurately, a restoration of pa past tax revenue levels? Um, and you know, he says that I've seen some polls supporting increased taxation, uh, but he's not sure if that plays out in Alberta. Uh, just as an aside, uh, Chris, I would say the polling that we've done suggests that people uh, would be open to the idea of paying a little bit more for quality services. In a similar vein, uh, Karen asks, uh, she says, right-wing governments weaponize uh, paying taxes, uh, and they use that as their central message. Uh, public services are the last great bargain. Does Alex have any suggestions about a progressive message uh, on the subject of revenue reform? So those two questions on uh, the weaponization of taxation as a political strategy. Oh, you're you're muted, Alex. Yeah, I'll I'll jump in. Sorry, Brad. I keep jumping in because I'm old and I don't know how much time I have left. I noticed, by the way, Gil, you skipped over Fiona's fabulous comment, so you should check the chat. In any case, um, the two comments on, on, on tax. Let me say generally, I think almost all the polling, almost all the polling shows that there's a huge readiness for taxing the rich. The Panama Papers, other kinds of leaks have shown how, how much the rich have been able to avoid paying their fair share. Those, you know, it makes sense to people that those who have benefited most from the institutions pay most to make them better. That just makes sense to people. And they should pay a higher share than those who have benefited less. So uh, excess profit taxes, you know, you know that 80% or more than 80% of our meat is processed by two meat processing companies. We're paying unbelievable amounts for meat and their profits are going through the roof. Well, let's change that. Let's start ta taxing back those excess profits. So I think there's a huge appetite for taxing the rich and that shouldn't be the end point, but that's not a bad place to start. An excess profit tax, tax wealth, a, a, a wealth tax makes sense to me. Change the capital gains. Why are we... People understand when you say to them, it's not right that uh, income from work is taxed at a higher rate than income from money. And then when money makes money, we pay less tax than when our sweat makes money. Now, people get that that's not right. So number one, I think there's a, bu a bunch of taxes people are ready for. And because of the sharpness of inequality, those are the taxes that are right for rebalancing power and deconcentrating power. So it makes sense. Secondly, I think you have to remind people, you know, people, my parents were small business people and they hated paying taxes, but they still vote. You know, they had all this sort of small business ethic. They didn't like regulations. They didn't like taxes, but they kept voting for governments that raised taxes. Why? Because, you know, for my parents, Medicare was a miracle. They, the, the notion that in their adult life, Medicare was suddenly made available so they could go to a hospital and not pay. My, I can remember my dad coming home shocked to say, you know, I went, they didn't want money. It's unbelievable. So they watched the, the benefits of their tax dollars very visible. They were alive when pensions were introduced, when education was, was spread, when student loans were introduced. We have stopped building and we have to remind people what their tax dollars are, uh, are buying and what the tax dollars will buy in the future. We have to make the, reconnect the taxes with the services that they get. And that's a big job. So we have to do that. And when we do that, all our evidence says people are willing to pay for services they value. 
So we have to, but one, I know you want me to share, but one last thing is we have to be unafraid. We have to be unafraid of the moral arguments. And that is my generation to suck the marrow out of, out of the society. And it's time for us to pay it forward. That's what intergenerational fairness requires. And we should be willing to say so. Sorry. There you go. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Listen, uh, these sessions go by incredibly quickly, uh, so we're going to have to wrap up right away. But before we do, uh, I just want to throw out just a couple of the final questions from uh, the people watching this discussion. Uh, the first is from Gloria, who who says uh, that she would like to know uh, how we'll make sure that Indigenous people are included in whatever plan we choose with as progressives to go forward, how we will how will we include them in the message um, uh, for everyone and uh, to make sure that Indigenous people uh, are not being left behind by public services. And, and they have been. I mean, like public services have not always been there uh, for Indigenous people uh, as much as, uh, as they should have been. And, and uh, Gloria is raising that that, that question, you know, like, how do we include Indigenous people in the discussion? How do we make sure that the evolution of public services uh, acknowledges that uh, public services have not always been there for uh, Indigenous Canadians in the way that have been for other Canadians? And then also there is a, there's a request uh, in the chat for, uh, is there a source uh, for people to turn to in terms of, uh, you know, getting the arguments that we've been discussing today, if there's like a, you know, and I know, Alex, you've written a couple of uh, really great books, and this might be an opportunity for plug them. But if you could address Gloria's question, and, and maybe the desire for further reading. I, I mean, I should create some more space for Brad. So perhaps, Brad, you want to take it first, and I'll jump in later. Okay, thanks, Alex. Um, just on, I guess, I think it was Gloria's question. Um, I think, you know, just without taking up too much space, like the way that reconciliation needs to be thought through when it comes to power and our institutions and, um, and governance is, is a big question that I don't have nearly all the answers to, and it's going to be, you know, a generations long process, but I will say that what's inspiring to me recently uh in your question just kind of makes me think of some of uh some of the folks that you know i got to know a little bit over the last few years who are who are running for office and i think will um challenge uh you know some of the uh some of the folks who might be in the you know in the cabinet um after the next provincial election i'm thinking of like brooks and others who are running for office, right? So I think that having that Indigenous perspective at the table um, is hopeful um, and thinking about ways that we can decolonize and indigenize our processes and, and uh, the way that we think about preserving and strengthening public services for everyone from an Indigenous lens. So that's good. People, you know, thinking about running and running uh, is one thing that I think is really actually quite exciting. Um, and the other, you know, in terms of resources, I mean, yeah, Canadians for Tax Fairness, I don't know, like, you know, Alison, you've got pretty much the list from a Canadian perspective. There's a couple of think tanks that I'll send links to that are based in the UK that I find really inspiring because they do challenge this notion that we need to engage from a marketized standpoint on the argumentation that public services are worth it. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite willing to concede the idea that we need to uh, do away with the moral argument. When we raised the minimum wage in, in the province here from 15 or 10, 1060, I think, Gil, or 1120 to $15, it was a lot over three, three years. It went to $15, first jurisdiction outside of Seattle, which had conditions to it, to go there. Um, we just did some polling because the cabinet was, are there any former cabinet members here? No, anyway, I'm not betraying cabinet confidence as I promised Alex, but there were a lot of people who who said, we can't do this because it's too fast and you know conditions have changed, changed. But we did some polling and we did a lot of research and invested in it that showed people were really, really supportive of the moral values-based argument, right? Everyone who works a full-time job should be able to at least pay for the basics and have a little bit left over to save. Right. And I would argue, you know, even if you don't have a full time job, you should have that. But we were going from a values place rather than, you know, doing the meta analysis of research that basically showed that it's a wash, you know, whether it has an impact, good or bad on jobs and everything else. Um, it was 
values that really carry the day. So I do think it's important for us not to let go of that when we think about, you know, what will move people and uh, build the power that we need to, uh, to support public services. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Brad. Uh, well, we're a little bit over time here, but I just want to perhaps give uh, both Alex and Brad uh, just one brief opportunity to, to sum up or wrap up uh, before we have to say goodbye uh, at the end of this session. So uh, Alex and then Brad. Yeah, on the Indigenous issue, I'll just add one thing to what Brad said, which is a commitment to Indigenous reconciliation has to be based in a commitment to Indigenous rights. And anything less is just inadequate. And when we take a rights perspective, a human rights perspective on a whole bunch of issues, everything changes. So care and and shelter have to be seen as in, as rights rather than as as items commodities for investment and speculation and what we'll find is the price comes down when we treat them as rights and the price goes up when we treat them as commodities so we have to rest and 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 frankly what we have to go, you know, I, I know the time is short, but I'm going to quickly tell you an anecdote. I'm talking to a politician over lunch real quick, and I'm telling him I'm no longer public servant. I'm telling him, go for a tax agenda. Say you're going to restore taxes as one of your, your I think it was Chris, one of your readers said, restore, uh, or Allison, restore taxes so that we can build the future that we choose because we, we can afford a good life. We, we don't need to listen. Go for taxes. And he said, well, if I say taxes, I'll lose. And I said to him, you're going to lose. Why don't you lose on principle? Why, why don't you lose fighting for something worth fighting for? And, and you know what? You might win. Well, he didn't do it and he lost. So bottom line is, I believe that there is a market for both the, for the moral argument Number one, bold is new, pragmatic, because there's a freight train coming at us. It's climate change and inequality and social fragmentation. And standing, being in the middle means getting run over. So this is time for bold. And the beauty of that is we can build something better. Antonio Gramsci described this time, uh, this kind of interregnum. Ups I don't know how many of you feel like the world's upside down, unmoored. Things are crazy. It's, and Gramsci described this as the time when the world is dying and the new world is not yet born, interregnum, a time of monsters and a time as well of opportunity. It is a time of monsters if we don't get bold and if we don't say we are going to take back the future, we're going to democratize the workplace, we're going to democratize our polity, and we're going to democratize everyday, everyday life and make sure that we are committed to equality, democracy, and sustainability, and we are going to be punishing and doing it. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. That's a that's a great way to wrap up the session. And uh, and you know, I I hate to cut it off because uh, honestly, I could listen to you guys talk for hours. Um, but I would just point out if you're interested in what you've heard uh, from either Brad or Alex. Uh, visit the Public Interest Alberta website for more uh, information on their campaigns. Uh, and uh, Alex is the author of many books. Just uh, Google his name, and uh, you'll see a lot of this, a lot of books that he's written that refer to the topics that he's discussed today. Um, so with that, and once again, I'm very sorry to wrap it up, but we have reached the end of our time. So I want to thank uh, Alex and Brad for their time, for their insight. Uh, I also want to thank everyone who's joined us. Uh, you know, it wouldn't happen if you weren't here to participate in the discussion. Uh, and if you like this discussion, please join us for future installments uh, in our Lunch and Learn series. Our next topic uh, will be public infrastructure and public procurement uh, and their relationship to the public good. Uh, and that will take place on September 20th. Please mark your calendars. Uh, so uh, that brings us to the end of our session today. Uh, hope to see you in September. Thanks again for joining us and uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. Take care.